month we've been talking about love that ignites hearts. Uh, we've been looking at marriages all month long and the wisdom in that. And it's not just if you're, only, if you're, free, if you're married, right? There's so much wisdom we've, we've been pulled out for our everyday life, if you're single, if you're a youth, and obviously if you're married. So today we're going to look at um, look that a little bit more. I'm Ryan McKenzie. Oh, this is my wife, Grace. Yeah, in case you didn't know. Um, we are um, we're the family ministry pastors here at Northwest. It is a joy to serve God and... Your kids, the youth, your families, to help you guys know God better, it is just one of the most fun things ever, like to look around and see the families we get to be around, and the team that serves around us, it is just the coolest thing ever. I love seeing the next generation just fall in love with Jesus. It is, it's exciting to me. Um, So today, today we're looking at love that ignites the hearts in the next generation. Um, if we're going to ignite hearts in the next generation, if we're going to ignite the hearts of our kids, of the youth, of our, in our family, then I believe we must be eternally minded, we must have a humble heart, and we must stretch ourselves. So we're going to look at that today, and as we think about being eternally minded, I, was, I mean, I was sitting here during the wedding day song and just watching this whole church <laughs> praise God and sing it like that holy wedding day. It was just the most beautiful thing ever. Like, this is who we're going to be with for eternity. Is such a beautiful picture. We're worshiping him. So what is the point of marriage? Right? What's the point of it? Is it just to love, love somebody, have some kids? Like, the ultimate point of marriage is to point to the ultimate marriage. Like, that's what's happening. The Bible says uh, that Jesus is coming back in, in Revelation 19, Verse 6 through 9, it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear, Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. (laughs) Jesus is returning for his bride. that's, That's the church. That's you. If you put your trust in Jesus, if you put your faith in him, he's coming for you. He's coming back for you. You're invited to the wedding. Your kids are invited to the wedding. Your spouse is invited to the wedding. I, I want to create a culture in our home that, that just Christ is always the most important thing. He is the most important. I want this church so to be just all about it. Jesus is the foundation of everything we do. And we do a lot, but he's always the foundation. I so want that in everything we do. But if we're not careful, we can easily and quickly get distracted by everything else that feels so important around us, right? That that pull and that feel to everything else. Let's do this here. Matt, do something silly with me for a second, okay? If, um, If you will. So we're going to close our eyes, and I want you to pick yourself or your spouse, probably your, your kids if you've got kids. We're going to imagine them. So close your eyes with me real quick. Just imagine your kids, and every dream you've ever had for them is coming true. Right? Everything you've ever wanted for them, uh, the, the, all your aspirations, they get the scholarship. You know, they get the job. They become a college athlete, maybe an Olympic champion or a CEO of a company. They start their own business. Maybe they're American Idol or they're like a TikTok celebrity. That'd be like super, that'd be the best thing ever. Like Super Bowl champion, a doctor, a lawyer, all the things you want. Maybe they're president of the United States. Wow. Okay, open your eyes with me. How good would it feel to know that you helped them set that up in their life? That they like, you helped them along the way and you made it all work for them. So you got the connections and the money. And the, like, that'd be incredible. We work so hard and save so much and spend so much just so our kids can have a chance at success in this life. How often do we think about working hard and setting things up for our kids to have success for eternity? How much more valuable is that? How much more important is that? Because listen to me. One, One day, your spouse, you, your kids... They're going to stand before God, and, and nothing else is going to matter. Like everything in this world will not matter. The only thing that will matter is why they did it, right, or who they did it for. Jesus is all that is going to matter. And Jesus said, we should love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It doesn't change just because you get married. It doesn't change just because we have a job. It doesn't change because we have kids. If you're his, you're his. He comes first no, no matter what. It, above my preference, right? Above my kids' practice schedule, above school, above our, above our marriage. He is first and foremost. We need to have an eternal view of everything we do in this life or we're going to go through life and just miss what he had for us. And at the great wedding, he'll say, I invited you, but you didn't want to come. I'm telling you today, you're all invited. And the door is open and he's asking you to come. As Christians, we take marriage really seriously. So we've been looking at it all month and it's sacred to us. Not just because we um, are obsessed with purity culture or we want to have a lot of rules about sex, right? Or we've got to have all the babies. We've got to fill up the nursery next door. No, it's sacred to us because, because it should point to our God. Jesus is the most humble man to have ever walked the earth. So it's no wonder that when we see the way that the Bible describes marriage, it describes it with such humility. The picture painted is of a husband loving his wife and giving up his life for her. A wife is described as submitting to and respecting her husband. There's such humility. And that's how Jesus treated us. That's how he treats us. He laid down his life for us, and we are to submit to his leadership. And all believers are to lay down our lives for each other, right? All believers are supposed to submit one to another. So in doing this, we paint a picture for our kids and for the rest of the world to see what that relationship between God and man is supposed to look like. The younger generation desperately needs and wants us to humbly lead them to Jesus. They need us to be an example of love, of preferring others above ourselves in the way we treat them, in the way we speak to people who disagree with us, in the way we treat our enemies, the way we treat our spouses, the way we treat our families at home when nobody else sees but our kids. So we're going to look at the life of Elisha today. We're going to look at two different stories. Um, he is a prophet of God. We read about him in the Old Testament. And he was discipled by Elijah. He listened to God. God did miraculous things through his life. So in 2 Kings 5, we find the story of Naaman, a very successful army commander, and he was very wealthy. He had it in really good with the king. So he was successful. He was powerful. But he came down with leprosy, an incurable disease, no amount of money, could heal. And he didn't know God, but he had a young servant girl, and she knew about God healing people. And she had the boldness and the humility to speak up and tell him about a man who hears from God and heals people. So we're going to read from verse 9. It says, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha was the prophet who, who was healing people. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean, like that of a young boy. I love that his servants pleaded with him to humble himself. And they reasoned with him to follow the word of the Lord. Healing was available to Naaman, but it wasn't in the way that he wanted it. He had success, he had experience, he had all the money and the power, but all of those things only clouded his vision to the point where he almost missed his miracle from God. And maybe his servants were a bit younger, like the, like the servant girl. Maybe they were more scrappy, right? They probably were not used to um, luxurious living like, like Naaman was. Maybe they... They weren't used to feeling more important than other people. So they were able to see a little bit clearer. And they were like, just, just get in the water, man. Like, sure, it's dirty water, but like your skin is falling off of you. Just, just do it, right? So I'm not saying that 
being poor or young or having less opportunities automatically makes someone more wise. Or that Naaman, he was just an old, rich man. <laughs> so obviously he didn't get it, right? But it's not having a lot of money or power or having very little, but it's pride that blinds people. They can't see when God has a miracle waiting for them. Naaman, um, sorry, because God, God says that he gives grace to the humble and he opposes the proud. And I don't, want, I don't want God opposing me. You don't want God opposing you. Naaman dipped in the river seven times. And from his original response, we can conclude that this probably felt very humbling to him. And um, I'm convinced that when we submit to God's ways and dip into the river of humility, when we submit and we say, okay, God, I'll do what you're asking me to do, this is not going to make me look very important. This is not in the way that I expected it to look. But I'll follow you we can be healed. There's healing for us. It just not by, might not be in the way that we like. Maybe you didn't deserve the things that have happened to you that caused hurt, and now it's eating you up, and it's affecting your relationships with other people and with God. And so many times, God provides a way to be healed, but it's going to take a lot of humility to repent, to confess and admit where, where we are wrong, to forgive people, and bless people instead of curse them, bless people who curse you, to do the things that are uncomfortable or things that don't look important, but just do it to obey God. I love that it says his skin became clean like that of a young boy. The next generation doesn't need us to dress like them, listen to all the same music, talk like them, use all of their phrases. Probably don't, don't try to do that. <laughs> That's not what's going to make us very effective or relevant to the next, to the next generation. But we're able to be effective when our hearts of stone become hearts of flesh. Yeah. We're able to become effective when we, we come to Jesus with a childlike faith. When we wait on the Lord and he renews our strength. When we return to our first love and do the things we did when we first met Jesus. They need to see that you can be in your 20s and your 30s. And even though you have a job and kids and a mortgage you're still passionate about the Lord, that none of those things are an idol. They, do, they don't need to see you look just like them. They need to see what's it going to look like when I'm, when I'm in my 20s, when I'm in my 30s. They need to see the example of someone who is in their 40s and 50s and not bitter. Someone who can laugh at the days to come, not fearful of aging. They need the example of people in their 60s and 70s who will still believe that they will conquer everything that God said that they will conquer, just like Caleb and Joshua. You can't control this. You can't buy it. You can't delegate it or be smart enough to make this happen. It all starts with humility. It's a humble path. It's not pushing away dreams that God is telling us to still pray for. It's not pushing away people that God is telling us to still be in unity with. Sometimes it's like we wish God would just wave his hand over the hurt and make it go away. But Jesus cares more about the condition of our heart than just our comfort. And there are some wounds that can really mess this life up. But pride, that can take us out for eternity. It's a narrow path, and many won't choose it. And the next generation doesn't need us to spend all of our efforts, all of our money, and all of our strategies trying to widen the path for them, trying to make it seem like it's something that it's not. They need us to follow Christ so that just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, so they can follow us as we follow Christ. I don't want to sit back and hope that they have revival, hope that they do something amazing. I want to run the race. I want to show them how to run and finish the race. At the end of a race, even the longest races, everyone running for the prize gives their all. That's the time when, you're, when you can see the finish line, especially when people just take out and like take off sprinting because they can see the finish line. And um, I just turned 40. I've got five kids, and it feels like they are growing up faster and faster every day. And the world has sold us this huge lie that we're supposed to slow down and live for yourselves towards the end. But I don't want to slow down. My passion for my Savior, his love for me has not grown cold. He hasn't given up on me. He has remained faithful to me, and my heart still burns for him. 
And as I get closer to the end, I want to follow him into a dirty river, into wherever, wherever he is, that's where I want to be. A very practical way that Ryan and I started teaching our kids to submit to God in this way is to talk about who made them. And you could do this at a very young age. When they are old enough to start communicating, when they are old enough to start sinning, which is very young, <laughs> to teach them you don't belong to yourself. So maybe they, they hit a sibling. Maybe they said unkind words. Part of, um, you know, we correct the, the behavior. And then part of that looks like sitting down with them and talking about who made you. And they know God made me. Who gave you? Who gave you those hands? Who made those hands? What, what did God give you hands for? Do you think he gave you hands to hit your sister? Who gave you your mouth? Do you think he gave you that wonderful mouth to, to say mean words? No. Why did he give you that mouth? And they'll come up with amazing things. To sing. To laugh. Right? To speak blessing. At this last um, youth getaway, um, we had a question and answer um, panel, and someone wrote in a question um, that broke my heart. It was regarding self-harm and what God thinks about it. So I decided i try the same things, the same thing that I do with my four-year-olds, because it's the same thing that works with me. It's the same thing that I need to remember. And I told them all, look at your hands. Who made your hands? What do you think God's dream is for you? What's his dream? What does he want you to use your hands to do? Think about your eyes. Who gave you those eyes? What does he want you to see about your bodies? What is, what is God's dream for you? Everywhere, everywhere they look, they see messages that their bodies are theirs to worship or treat like garbage, to do whatever they please with. And that's not an empowering or freeing message. At times when hormones are raging and emotions are big, and maybe they are not feeling like they love the way that they look that day, or they're not feeling like they did an awesome job that day. If they aren't rooted knowing God made me and I belong to him, this body is not my own. I didn't pick it out on Amazon. I didn't choose how tall I would be, how short I would be, how good I would be at different things. God made me, and I humbly submit to him, and I give him my life. If they don't know that, They are so easily deceived. The enemy constantly tries to get them to form habits of harming themselves, habits of hurting themselves and other people, habits of just giving away their bodies because who cares? But what is God's dream for them? It's so important to teach them that they are not their own. It brings freedom and truth in the way you live and the way that you treat others. And the way that we walk out our marriages, the way that we treat our spouses, that's going to show them what it looks like to be so changed by God's love that you know that you're not your own, that you were bought with a price. I'm back here crying, and I already know what she was going to say. Like, it was like... <laughs> uh, we recently... Oh talked with the, a lot of the team that lead the, the kids in Kids Church about what it looks like to stretch ourselves in love for the kids and the families of this church. So we, we read another story about Elisha, and um, so just to get to where we're at in the story, there's a, there's a couple that Elisha is close with, and he would stay with them, um, and at one point he tells the wife, in a year you're going to have a son. And so he leaves, him and his servant leave, or his disciple leave. A year goes by, she has a son, the son grows up. He's out in the field with his dad, hits his head, dies. Like that's where this story picks up. The mom is running to Elisha, telling him, come, my son needs you, just come to the house. So um, Elisha sends his servant ahead in 2 Kings 4, 31. It says, Gehazi, this is Elisha's disciple, his servant, Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. 
Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then he got on the bed and stretched himself out once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. He raises the dead. Hallelujah! This is big, and the first big thing to note here, there's nobody laying on your kids in kids' church, all right? Nobody's stretching themselves out, laying down on your, on your kids. So that's, we got a whole training we do, and that's not allowed, okay? So that's point one. <laughs> but we're going to look at what Elisha did, what Gehazi did. So the Bible says he stretched himself. He, this is a child and a grown man. Like, obviously, the boy's smaller than Gehazi, but it says, or than, um, than Elisha, but he says he stretched himself. Um, Charles Spurgeon once wrote, no stretching is harder than for a man to stretch himself to a child. He is no fool who can talk to children. It needs our best wits, our most industrious studies, our most earnest thoughts, our ripest powers to teach our little ones. The wisest man will need to exercise all of his abilities if he would become a successful teacher of the young. Man, I love that. Our kids need to be brought to life in Jesus. They need to be raised from dead to life. They're not just, oh, they go to church their whole life, so they're Christian. No, they need to be raised to life. Their hearts need to be ignited. It's going to take us stretching ourselves. And the difference in what Elisha did and Gehazi did is shocking to me. Like, Elisha told Gehazi what to do. He goes, he walks in, he lays his staff on the boy, like Elisha told him. He said, well, that didn't work. And he goes back to Elisha. And it's like, he's still dead. Right? That's, that's what happens. So Elisha comes in. He did what he was asked to do. He did what he knew to do. He just, it's almost like he didn't care, though. He just, there was no crying out to God. There was no prayer. There was no earnest. There was, there was nothing in him that was like, this has to happen. It was just, well, I did what you told me, and it didn't work. And I wonder how, much, how often we, we treat our kids that way. Like, we're just following orders. We're just doing whatever everybody expects of me. I'm a good dad. I'm a good mom. I'm a good youth leader, whatever it is. But our kids need a dad who'll do more than just bring home a paycheck and buy food. Our kids need a mom who'll do more than just organize play dates and drop them off at practice. Like, God is looking for men and women, for boys and girls who will stretch themselves for his kids. It will go beyond what anyone expects of them. People who will cry out for him and beg for his anointing to fall on themselves and to fall on the next generation. Not just show up and do what you told me to do. But there's something deeper that he's, that he's desiring for us. That he gave you your kids on purpose. It's not a mistake. They're in your home. He chose you to lead them to him. So that, that means that you can rely on him and they can rely on you, that you can lead your kids to God. He gave them to you for that purpose. So the question is, are you just showing up? Like, are you just doing what you feel like you're supposed to do? Are you like Gehazi? Or are you stretching yourself out for your kids? Are you like Elisha, praying, interceding on behalf of them? Are you giving everything you have for their eternity in mind? Not just, you're going to make the baseball team. You know, like that's, There's a difference there. And we know... This whole thing makes me think about Jesus and how he cried out to the Father in the garden. That he, he prayed so earnestly that he's sweating blood. It, he, and it, the Bible even says that he intercedes on our behalf to this day, now. That he's praying for us to be with him and be with the Father. This makes me ask, how often do we cry out for our kids to be saved, for, for our wives to be saved, for our husbands to be saved, for the kids in your neighborhood and the families in your neighborhood to be saved? How often are we hitting our knees and stretching ourselves out on the floor, crying that God would save them, interceding for them? Man, he desires to use you to raise the dead. Like there are dead people walking around all around you, and he desires to use you to raise them to life in Christ. When you realize that, you start to pray in a different way. You start to pray more often. You start to pray with more power. All of a sudden, the way you look at life just changes, right? Like the, the bedtimes and the car rides go from like, let's hurry up and get through this. Let's hurry up and get on to the next thing. These, these inconveniences and check off the to-do list to like, this is an opportunity to disciple my kids. This is an opportunity to pray with them, to get to know them. This is a chance I have with them that I can find out who they are even more and lead them to Christ. On this last uh, youth getaway, uh, we had another session where we just did like these kind of random, we call them pop-up prayers, and they weren't, um, mandatory. So whoever wanted to come and pray could come pray. And uh, it was so inspiring to see your kids, to see the youth in this church 
come and show up to something. They didn't have to. <laughs> they could have stayed and played games. They could have rested in their bunks. They could have done whatever they wanted to do at the camp, but like they wanted to come and learn how to pray. They came and prayed out loud. They prayed for each other. They prayed for healings. They heard God's voice and, to- and told each other about it. Like it was, pr- they were crying out for their schools, for their parents, for their, their neighborhoods. It was, it was really special. And I, I just really, more and more, I see this generation is crying out for a real experience with God. I see it. I see it in you guys. Like, I see you want him. Like, my kids, I see their friends. I see the youth and the kids in this church really want him. I see you guys at group every week, like, wanting him more and more. It is the most special thing ever. And parents, I just want to encourage you, like, pray for your kids. Pray with your kids. They might not... It might be awkward or weird at first if you don't do it all the time, but they really do desire it and they really want it. It doesn't matter how old they are. It's like if they're babies, you just pick them up. They don't have a choice, right? They can't say no. Like you just hold them. You say, I'm praying for you. I don't care if you understand this. You can sing over them. You can pray over them. You can read the Bible to them. Like that is, you're setting them up at that age in your arms for eternity. Right? Don't tie ankle weights around them and like make them strong athletes when they're babies. Like hold them and pray for them. Like that's uh, when they're toddlers or a little bit older. Like we have two four-year-olds right now, and it might sound like bedtime prayers are like, "Hey Jesus, thank you for pizza and Coke." Like that was our prayer the other night because we were lazy with dinner and we got pizza, and I gave my four-year-old Coke. Judge me, all right? Judge me, <laughs> judge me. <laughs> but he loves me because. <laughs> But it's the most precious thing I've ever seen is for my four-year-old son to sit in his bed and he just says, hey, Jesus, like he's sitting right in front of him. Like the childlike faith that that takes to know that he really is right there with me. My God is right next to me. He's listening to me. Man. And as they get older and they keep praying and you keep praying for them and with them, it's bedtime before they go to school. When they get in trouble, is it just... You stay in your room until we both forget about it and I'm not mad anymore or do we come back together and pray and we go to God with this. When you're proud of them, praying for your family, with your family, for your neighbors, let us cry out with our kids. Let us cry out for our kids. Um, There's nothing quite like hearing your kids pray for each other. Some of our most, my most favorite ministry times ever our moments in our living room when our kids are together, getting words from God for each other, praying for each other, asking God to heal each other, just blessing each other and crying and repenting together as a family. It is something special that happens to your family and to your neighborhood when that happens in your home. The Bible says that Jesus is interceding for us right now. and it, It's amazing to me that he allowed himself to be stretched out on the cross. Right? Even arms stretched out, nails hammered in, and he's praying right there, forgive them. And then even now to this day, he's still crying out. And in Romans, it says, Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us right now. And in Hebrews, it says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. When we see that kind of love in action, like it changes us. We can't help but stretch ourselves for our friends, for our family, for our spouse. Um, so I want to I do something together here. Um, if you guys would stand with me. And um, we're going to sing a song at the end here. And, um, but first, I'd like to pray, all of us pray for the youth and the people that serve the youth in this church. So if you're, if you're uh, 18 and under, just throw your hand up real high. 18 and under. If you're 18 and under, throw your hand up real high. Awesome. You guys see the hands up? I'd like for everybody else to go to them. Or if you're around them, stretch your hand out. We're going to pray for them. So a lot of them are down here. So some of them are back there. There's hands everywhere. If you serve youth in our church, and you're a small group leader, or you work in the nursery, or kids' church, anything, put your hand up too. I want people to pray for you. We're going to come together united for the next generation. Parents, if you know your kids are down front, you can come down here and pray for them. It's good. (laughs) Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the youth in this church, for the kids in this church. God, we thank you that you see them and you know them 
and you want them, that they're not just sitting on the sidelines waiting for their turn, but right now is their time. Right now is their turn. You say that they are to come to you now. You desire to talk to them now. You desire for them to hear your voice now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move in our youth and in our kids. We ask that you would bless our small group leaders and our kids' church leaders and our nursery workers. God, that you would bless them and fill them with your presence so they would have wisdom from on high, that they would know exactly what to do and what you want. God, that they would stretch themselves humbly for you and for the next generation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now we want to worship all together to end today. No matter your age or stage in life, we're going to sing to Jesus. We're going to remind ourselves of where this is all heading. And maybe you have the best marriage that anyone has ever had. You have the best kids. It's still only a shadow. It's still just a small glimpse of what Jesus is preparing us for. The ultimate and eternal union of God with his beloved people. The ultimate family. Our actual home. And maybe if marriage has been something that's only brought you a lot of heartache, you didn't experience God's plan for, for family, but maybe you experienced a lot of brokenness in a sinful world. You are just as much invited to that wedding. And even though it might feel like the sadness isn't going to end right now, and it's so great, this life really is like a vapor. And Jesus said he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He wants to clothe you, and he wants to be one with you forever. And it's not just... It's not just an idea, but he sacrificed deeply to be united with you forever. And maybe you've never fully understood this before, that Jesus dying on the cross meant that he cleanses you and clothes you. If you want to give your life to Jesus right now, or if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus right now, I just encourage you to cry out to him, to say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, come make your home in me. I want to be with you forever. I repent of my sins. Let's worship our God.